the world of the chief digital officer is certainly a very interesting one. And CIOs and CMOs and analysts and pundits and everybody else are wondering, what's a chief digital officer do? Well, today, on episode number 89, we are privileged to have with us a chief digital officer. I'm Michael Krigsman with my fabulous and friendly co-host, Vala Offshore. Vala, how you doing? <laughs> All right. How about let's do a high five. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully everybody can hear that. I think so. So we're here today, Vala, with Sri Srinivasan, who is the Chief Digital Officer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. The most influential museum on Twitter, based on a recent study. So that's maybe a reflection of an awesome Chief Digital Officer, but we'll learn more about that as we have our conversation. So uh, Sri, could you please uh, provide us a brief background about yourself? Sure. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on your show. And I love any invitation that doesn't require me to get on a plane and <laughs> fly out anywhere. Uh, I know lots of the folks who are listening love getting on a plane, but I'm not one of those people. Uh, I've joined the Met about a year and a half, a year and a quarter ago, about uh, in 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 middle of uh, last year, and in 2013. And I came here after spending a lifetime at Columbia University. I arrived on campus at 21, and I planned to leave when I was 81, but I left at the age of 43 to come to the Metropolitan Museum. And I would not have left for any other job except this one. I had grown up a few blocks from the Met and gone to school one block from the Met, and I had this idea that I have a 30-year one-way love affair with the Met. And if you love someone for 30 years and they call you, you take the call. And then with your wife's permission, you carry on. And that's what we did, and I did, and that's how I ended up here. A couple of quick things. I taught in the journalism program at Columbia. I was a full-time professor there, and I was also a dean of admissions and career services and that part of mm -hmm. uh, the world of um, studying and academia. And then I had the privilege to spend a year as the first chief digital officer of Columbia University and trying to understand and navigate that world, and then this opportunity at the Met came up. We have here about 70 people doing digital media at the Met, and we work very closely with our CTO, whose his name is Jeff Spar. He and I work very closely together. We're in multiple meetings every week, and uh, it's a true partnership that uh, makes everything we do possible. I also work very closely with our CMO, uh, Cynthia Round, who came to us from a career at places like P&G, but also was at United Way, the world's largest charity. So those are some of my partners in crime here. We have another kind of CDO, a chief design officer, and all of this is to say that the Met is very committed to the world of digital and technology, and I'm here to uh, take your questions and learn along the way myself. Great. Well, thank you so much. So, so you were at Columbia for many years. You were a journalist, and you were a professor, and then you were the chief digital officer of Columbia. What's, what, is, what is that pathway? What's the pathway from, from journalism to being a chief digital officer? Let's start there, just as a kind of, uh, to continue to set the stage. Sure. I would say that people are confused about my my past and wondering what I'm uh, what I'm doing here and there are certainly days when I wonder what I'm doing at the Met I am a fan but I'm not an expert on any kind of art myself but I do love storytelling and I believe that the future of all businesses is in storytelling and in connecting the physical and the digital the in-person and the online and at the Met we are committed to this idea of storytelling. And I tell people that on a very informal basis, my goal is to tell a million plus stories about our million plus works of art to a billion plus people. So that's where that journalism, digital media background comes in. We were, we've were we been teaching digital media at Columbia University's journalism school since the fall of 1994, which as you know is ancient history. and. Uh, in that spring of 95, we were super excited because a new product had come along called Netscape, 
Until then, we were working on Mosaic, and Netscape was arrived had arrived, and version 0 0.9 was what my colleagues used to launch our first websites. And uh, back in those days, it was very easy to be the digital guy because no one knew anything. Our students didn't know anything, and so now, all, now as people become more and more sophisticated, to stay ahead of them, we have to work a lot harder as professors. Yeah, so 20-year anniversary of Netscape, and you have one of the founders, Mark Andreessen, very active on Twitter on a daily basis. So uh, one of the more prolific uh, you know, uh, investors and thought leaders on, on Twitter. So let's step back a little bit, and maybe you can help uh, explain to our audience you know, what, what is a chief di uh, uh, digital officer? What does that role encompass and, and the goals of a CDO? So you were the first CDO, I believe, in 2012 at Columbia University, and now the CDO at the Met. So please help define the role for us. Sure. And we should say that CDOs are a, a brand new type of role within corporations. And it's also a role that's in transition itself. And maybe we can get into it a little later. It might be a transitionary role itself, meaning that it may not always be around. And so that's kind of a provocative thing to talk about, and we will. But maybe let me back up and just explain a CDO uh, as opposed to a CTO, a CIO, and, and similar roles. I see it as the person who deals with the content that's created and shared and interacts with the public-facing public part of the museum. And so for us, that means um, everything. So I have a team that does email marketing. We have a team that does website, a team that does social media. We doubled it to two people. We have a team that has a, a, a media lab, uh, which is just getting started. We've had it for a while, but we're doing a reboot and a re-energizing of our media lab. It's about just a two-person operation, thinking about the future of the museum. We do a team that does the interactives in the gallery. We have audio guide, which is something that people still use. Uh, we have mobile developers and doing that kind of work. We have a team that does video and does our online publications and so on and on and on. We have a group of uh, folks who do our CMS development. We work on a platform called Sitecore that some of your colleagues may know. Uh, on email, we use uh, Cheetah Mail. So it's all these different types of platforms. And then uh, we have some museum-specific technology that we use. All of this is done in conjunction with our CTO's team. They're the ones who build the infrastructure. Our galleries are all wired. Uh, so, um, so he does that for us and for, for the museum. Uh, we do all kinds of things that require the CTO and CIO to be in close, close contact. So you're like the um, the content arm. If, if we think about a Venn diagram where you have the intersection of technology, digital delivery, and content, you are the content arm. Would that be a correct way of phrasing it? Yeah, that? I think so. That's, that's one way to look at it. Anything that touches the public audience, we are the ones responsible for that. But it's all built on the infrastructure that the CIO, Jeff Spar has pulled together for us. I'm hesitating because it's, 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 it's almost as if the boundary between what IT is doing, that, that the CIO, and what you're doing, it, it's got to be a very gray kind of boundary. As somebody who has a lot of gray hair, I like gray. <laughs> so what, uh, I think that's, that's absolutely fair. And it would also be fair to say on any given day, there might be some confusion about who does what. But this idea of thinking, does it face the audience or does it not face the audience? I think that helps us uh, stay out of each other's way. But as I said, we do so many things together that we don't worry about all the things that we have to do separately. Sure. So it looks like there's a quad of, let's say, digital business transformation that has a CIO, a CTO, a CMO, a CDO, and then the design chief that perhaps ensures that the customer experience is, is, is preserved as you're adding technology and capabilities to the museum. Is that a fair I, assessment? I think that's very good. I don't think we, anybody at the Met has ever sat down and, 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 and drawn any of that out. And you have to remember, this all fits into a much larger context at, at the Met. Uh, at the Met, we're all about the art. So all of us are in service of the art. And I should give, for the folks who 
don't know, just a, a 30 seconds on the Met itself. People always want to know biggest, largest, oldest, those kind of parameters. Sure, sure, please, so please. Let, let's do it. Uh, we're the world's largest encyclopedic museum, which means we represent 5,000 years of human creativity from every corner of the world. Every country of the world is represented here. There are fabulous museums in other parts of the world and in New York, but not all of them have every culture. They are specializing in certain things or having gaps in them but we have everything. We are going to celebrate our 150th anniversary uh, in 2020, and that gives you a sense of how long we've been doing this uh, as well. We have 6.2 million visitors in person at the Met, the largest tourist attraction in New York, and we have about 40 million people online. And this is where I get in trouble because I said my goal is to tell a million stories to a billion people what kind of crazy person gives his boss a set of metrics on which he can be judged against? So we're only at 40, so I have a long way to go to hit a billion. That's amazing. So, you know, I grew up in New York, and the Met, I, I mean, I just have such incredible... That's the one thing that I really miss about Boston is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, but tell us, why did the museum need to create a chief digital officer role because the museum has been in the business of presenting content to audiences for since its since its founding and at the same time we have a question from Twitter from Lauren Brussel who is a big honcho reporter at CIO magazine who asks what are the top challenges for the Met in terms of digital content so it's two challenge questions. Uh, why did the museum need to create the role, and what are the big challenges? Well, as the person who has the role, obviously, I'm glad they did. And I think the reason they did is because the Met is no longer the old Met. It's not, say, your grandma's collection of art or your grandpa's collection of art. It is a living, breathing museum that not just has all this great art, but collects art and acquires new art. and is constantly also a place where art is being made and we have hundreds and hundreds of art classes that are free that people uh, can take and participate in adult classes to young kids uh, we work also very closely with our head of education her name is Sandra Jackson Dumont who came to us from the Seattle Art Museum so she's full of tech ideas and she and I work very closely together uh, just this morning we were touring through a group from my daughter's favorite app is an app called Paper from a company called uh, 53 all spelled out 53 and the app is called Paper and it's at 53 if you want to check them out and what they are is an iPad app where you can draw and uh, they just do it in a beautiful way so we already teach iPad sketching but we're working with this with these folks to improve the way we do iPad sketching. So you come into a gallery, you take a class, you'll be given an iPad and one of their new uh, special pens that interact. So that kind of technology uh, we're able to, uh, to use. But this all goes to the idea that there are a lot of opportunities for a chief digital officer to get his or her team to be thinking about the digital aspects. For many, many years, the Met uh, was just the Met and people could would just show up. But now we are in a battle for attention, not just among other museums, but sort of everything. And uh, as, as a couple of you know, uh, because you, you commented on it, I was uh, lucky enough to have just returned from NASA, where NASA hosts something called NASA Social, where they bring alleged sure. influencers to come and see behind the scenes at NASA. And that was such a meaningful ex experience for me. When I was growing up, I would have absolutely been an astronaut, except that I added, I'm scared of heights, I don't, I'm not good at math, and I didn't have the guts. But other than that, I'm <laughs> Neil Armstrong, basically. And I would have loved to be an astronaut. So I couldn't do that, but the next best thing was getting to see behind the scenes at NASA. We were there for the launch of Orion, and I got up at 3.30 on Thursday morning and was there and waiting and waiting, and it didn't launch. And then I got in a plane and came back home because I knew I had to be here on Friday to be with all you wonderful people. And I had lots of meetings in New York, and I wanted to be in my office when I talked to you. But this idea that if NASA has to do this, 
then what hope do the rest of us have? NASA sending a rocket into space and they worry about attention, then what hope do we have? I was in a meeting this year with Sal Khan from Khan Academy, sure. and you know this K through 12 plus plus plus, this organization that's changing the world of education, and Sal said something to me that really depressed me. He said that the vast majority of people who will benefit from my service, my free service, whose lives will be improved tonight, whose kids' lives will be improved tonight, whose neighbors' grandkids' lives will be improved tonight, have never heard of my service and will never hear of my service. And I said, oh my God, if Sal, who's doing this, can't, can't, um, can't do, has to do all this promotion and all of that, then what hope do the rest of us have? So that's one of the things that we have to do as the Met is tell our stories, our internal stories. I was touring a group of people through the Met this morning, including those folks from 53, and you end up walking in our Arms and Armor Gallery, which is so beautiful, mm -hmm. would have been the one of the largest museums of Arms and Armor in the world if it weren't just inside the Met, and you walk right by these handmade spurs by the, that were crafted and by a silversmith in Boston named Paul Revere. And you wouldn't even notice them because they're just lost among all these other things. And that's the challenge. In any other museum, you would have had a shrine to Paul Revere and these spurs, but here they're kind of lost. And that's the challenge of having a big place. So to your uh, question from Twitter, what are some of the challenges? Telling the stories are a big challenge. Uh, another challenge is how do we harness all this excitement that our audience has and our, our, our employees have. We have 2,200 employees at the Met, including hundreds of guards, and, uh, and we have these curators, 100 plus curators, 100 plus con con uh, people who are conservators and scientists inventing new ways of preserving this art. And so we have to think about those very strongly, very deeply, and think about how we make, that, make those work. And what I try to tell people when they ask about the role of digital in a museum mm -hmm. is I, I kind of think about our, our, our curators who might buy a beautiful Greek vase <laughs> and, and decide that this, uh, they, they'll buy it. It's 2,000 years old. And as a CDO, my instinct might be to say to them, I want you to do X, Y, and Z by the third quarter or by close of business or for you know, Q5, I mean like Q4, like words that make a lot of sense to everybody on this call, right, but right. for a curator who's thinking not in five-year bursts or five-month bursts, five-decade bursts, she is thinking about this for the next 2,000 years. So what is my role and how do we motivate our team? What we say is that it's our role to make several things with this cup. We need to make it shine online so that it's so attractive that people want to come and see it in person. We want to get a generation of people to support that, that cup so that people will come and you know we can have a roof over its head and it can stay. But also, we have what we call our collection information systems. That these are the people who do our digital asset management and our text management of our fields of information so that everything we do is cataloged in a permanent way so that five years from now, someone can't come and say, hey, isn't that a knockoff made in India? It's not from Greece. Well, the only proof we have is that digital record that we have kept that has the provenance that we publish publicly. All of these things that they can see that knows that that is in fact here for 2,000 years. So what we talk with our team, our goal is to, is to keep that cup and keep it with us for 2,000 years and we have a role to play in that process and we think about that all the time. Sure, sure. So in this, you know, hyper-connected world, in this participation economy where you have folks coming to the Met and, you know, they've got their, you know, their tablet, their phone, their iPad, you know, and, and, and at the same time you have technology like sensors and Internet of Things and augmented reality. How do you, as the chief digital officer, look at the, 
innovation velocity that exists today and then plan a roadmap of this is how I can boost participation by using maybe an Oculus Rift or, or, or sensor technology that detects patrons that frequently visit the Met and so on and so forth. What's the process of building your technology roadmap for the next 12, 24, 36 months? So have you been looking into my Google Docs and figured out everything we're doing here? Because you use several terms that are in our plans and in we our, do our plans research. That are, yeah, we're, research. We're, we're, very fair. we're connected to the NSA. Yeah, yeah. I'm really worried about this because I can I can take apart the list you said, but including eye beacons, which we're playing with. Sure, sure. Uh, we have Oculus Rifts here. We have four instances of Google Glass. I don't know what the plural of glass is. Uh, we have um, various ways in which we're trying to find ways in which we can connect and uh, deal with our, uh, our, our visitors and, and connect them with the museum better, connect them amongst each other better. Sure. Those are all things we have to do if we want to be successful at the Met. So those are things we, we work on, and most of those projects are things we will work on with our CTO and our CMO, uh, building a CRM strategy. Right. Uh, by the way, I love talking to you guys because you know all these words. Uh, <laughs> normally when I'm in a conference or with, uh, with folks from the art world, sure. I, these, are, these are not jargon that uh, everybody's familiar with, which is fine because most of the time I am not familiar with the things that they're saying. Right. And uh, part of it is this idea that uh, I tell people that the role of uh, the CDO is also as chief listening officer. CDO, chief listening officer, because what we, you need somebody within the museum who's listening for new ideas and saying, is this worth it? Does this make sense for us? And you all know that you can spend, as anybody in the tech world, your entire day dealing with vendors all day long, all these pitches. And I tell people that let's take as many of these pitches as possible because you don't know what is something that is going to change your business and mm -hmm. what is something that is absolutely worthless. Sure. And that's because everything that we use today that we love and swear by was once something that someone had to pitch. And a lot of luck was involved along the way. So you, you know, it's, that's interesting because that's awesome. mo most of the senior executives that I know have put layers and layers and elaborate mechanisms in place to filter those pitches out, but you're doing the opposite. How, but how do you manage that? Ah, no, I'm, you're going to make me regret this, aren't you? I just said this <laughs> out loud. And We're public. only live with a bunch of startup founders watching. No worries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't say anything, guys. That was my evil twin. What I would say is that it's part of my role. I mean, it's defined in my role, in my mind, as chief listening officer, then you've got to listen. And by the way, a couple of things are some tips to startups because I've been teaching uh, entrepreneurship, working with entrepreneurs, and been involved in startups myself. I taught for four years with an awesome guy named Ken Lehrer, Kenneth Lehrer, the co-founder of okay. the Huffington Post, yeah. who runs Lehrer Ventures, and now Lehrer Hippo, and uh, who's working with Eric Hippo. He has, he's one of the most influential folks in the world of, uh, of, of entrepreneurship. And one of the things that I have learned from him is the importance of when you're, when you're doing your work, even how you pitch it matters. And, uh, for example, I keep getting pitched by these social listening tools, right, all these social media tools, and you'd be shocked how many of them don't listen themselves. Uh, some of them don't know that I have tweeted about them, uh, or they have come in to a meeting which I've given them. They're sitting with me in a meeting, and we say, okay, these are the next steps. I'd like to learn more. Let's do this and that. And then, because I filled in some form somewhere, uh, two days later, I get a cold call from somebody who uh, is at the same company, has no idea that they already got the meeting, they already have a plan, and they're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years, I've noticed that vendors have this really clever way where the email subject line says, uh, uh, free on Wednesday, like very specific mm -hmm. in the subject line. So you think, my God, is this somebody I already know? It says free on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's somebody I met at a conference or whatever. And then I read it, and it's it's a standard pitch. But they're like, let's get on your calendar for Wednesday. And uh, I, I understand the hustle, because you got to hustle if you're doing this. But listen to your own teams. Listen before you reach out. So for example, uh, you guys know the importance of the, when we live in a social world, 
for the first time, vendors and others have this enormous advantage that the people who you're reaching out to have public profiles with public information, and they're sharing way too much, including me. So what happens is, if I get a, e a cold call email on uh, Wednesday night when I'm preparing to go see Orion lift off, that means this person mm -hmm. hasn't read anything I've said for the last three days. And this is not because I'm important, but this just means they have they don't bother to look and read before they come. That's why I tell everybody, get this app called Rapportive, R-A-P-P-O-R-T-I-V-E, Rapportive, which has been now since bought by LinkedIn. And what it does is when you compose an email to me, on the side will come all my social status mentions. And you will see, so for example, if you're about to write to me saying, Sri, can I meet you? It'll say, I'm at my grandfather's funeral. Do you want to be the guy who contacts me on my grandfather's funeral? No. Instead, right. you might write a note a week later and say, Sri, I'm sorry to see your grandfather passed away. Whenever you come back for air, I'd love to talk mm -hmm. to you. And again, this is not because I'm important, but that's because it's common sure. decency to understand this. And you have these tools now. So when I wrote more than 50 articles for the New York Times, I never cold called anybody. And that was from the New York Times. I believe that the best way to reach somebody is via email and to give it 10 days if you don't hear back and write another note. Nobody minds that. But that's how I work. Other people may love getting phone calls. Sure. But, but you should see these kind of aggressive phone calls where they have no idea what I'm doing when they call. Again, not because I'm important, but this is, what, this is the new world we live in. It's so much easier to sell now because you can understand something about the person you're selling to. Otherwise, you are doing it all blind. So please, don't do it blind. You don't need to do it blind. It's incredible that marketing organizations are not taking advantage of, for example, social listening tools and some of the applications you mentioned to add. Their own social listening tools. Their own social listening tools. In fact, anybody that has a decent CRM solution perhaps already has the, the, the ability to, to look at, uh, at all of the various social channels and add contextual intelligence to their to their to their process, so that they're not trying to reach you when it's you know when you're uh, at at NASA. And by the way, if you have pictures uh, yeah. of of NASA, please share because uh, I will. As we're talking, I'll pull them up here. Uh, that's awesome. That's that's yes. awesome. Wait, wait, you see the astronauts on, on 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 with NASA now frequently tweet, and they're some of the more popular folks on 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 Twitter with those. With the, just a brilliant photography, uh, and you've got the Mars rover tweeting and so on and so forth. So, so here's here's an astronaut that's Astro oh, that's awesome. Rex, right yeah, there, awesome. and I was so excited to meet astronauts. Uh, and what I what I think is, by the way, that I have there's a there's a person at Twitter named Erica Anderson. Her Twitter handle is at Erica America, and uh, you should all follow her. And Erica has this great line: If you're good in real life, you can be great on Twitter. And I believe that she's right, but let's take it one step further. If you're good in real life, you can be great on social. But if you're great in real life, you can be awesome in social. But if you're bad in real life, you'll be awful on social. And I see some terrific people who are just not using their social as well as they could. Maybe they didn't get the training. Maybe they don't understand. And maybe they can be doing more. I, I met this guy at a conference named uh, Dan Goods plural, at Dan Goods. He works for JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, and he's just terrific. He's not very active on Twitter, so what I want everybody to do is to follow him on Twitter so that he will tweet more. But there are people like this you see every day, these astronauts. This is Astro Rex that you can follow, Astro underscore Rex. So you can follow him. But, I, but the favorite moment was, um, well, there were several favorite moments, including, by the way, sometimes you don't see things in front of you. I stood in front of this launch, this is a, a near a launch pad at Cape Canaveral, before I noticed that there is a space shuttle right on the ground. You see the uh, yeah. outline? <laughs> I, I stood awesome. for half an hour, never noticed it, and it's actually a quarter mile walking track. So of course I went for a little walk around it, it was so exciting. And But I want to show you, I want to tell you this little story. That gentleman who runs all of NASA, the head of all of NASA, is this gentleman here, is, uh, and he's Charlie Bolden, and he's not on Twitter. And we can talk about bosses on Twitter in a moment if you'd like to. And he's terrific. And then what happened was uh, we had a kind of a bad selfie background. It doesn't say NASA in any way. 
<laughs> so I pulled him in. I just turned him around and said, "Let's stand here." And he asked. He had no idea who I was, and he said, uh, "So what do you do?" And I said, "I work at the Met." And now you're about to see. By luck, I captured his reaction to my saying, "I work at the Met." So you look at this and look at his face. <laughs> wow. And he said, "You have a better job than me." <laughs> it sounds like you do. It, <laughs> but I said, "My God, this is the head of NASA. Are you kidding me?" Of course, you have the best job in the world. And he—he he was asked, by the way, at the press conference, "Isn't it that this is not such a big deal? Because after all, you're not sending any people, and we're not going to get to Mars till 2030. So what's the big deal?" So this man, the head of Mars, uh, the uh, head of NASA, says to his audience, all these journalists and everybody said, "It's a B." It's, he said, "It's a BFD." Uh, yeah. <laughs> who else would say that and uh, get away with it? And I loved the idea of that he would say it, and it just it just shut everybody up after that uh, awesome. because they they answered. And then look at the joy when someone sees a, an astronaut. There's a little boy with one of the other astronauts we met, and he's just so excited. And that's what NASA needs to capture and tell these stories. And we need to do that for all our institutions. Whatever they might be, wherever they might be, this is 5 a.m. arriving for the launch of Orion. Look how dark that is, and then we waited till 9:30. Look how bright that is, and then we left when it didn't launch. But I came back home uh, so that I could be here and watch it with my family. And where do we find these photos? Do you put them on Facebook, Twitter? You have Instagram, yeah, Vine, everywhere. Uh, we, I live tweeted from uh, at Sree S R E E. Uh, and my uh, my Twitter my Instagram is Sreenet S R E E N E T, and my Facebook is Sreenet, and my um, I have a Facebook business page called Three Tips where I share my best social media and other tips. Awesome. And here's here's something funny that uh, that happens sometimes with these things that you don't realize how useful it might be to get your name the way you want it on these channels and. I didn't bother to sign up, so now whenever a new platform launches, I don't join it necessarily, but I certainly book the name on it. And there are some tools that kind of help you do that. But I certainly recommend that. And one other tip: uh, what happened was NASA brought us all together, and they treated the social journalists, the social reporters who we were. It was called NASA Social Hash NASA Social, and they gave us the same respect, the same access, and the same location as all the major news outlets. So I was standing next to somebody from the biggest Japanese TV network, and this awesome. side someone else, and they treated us all equal. But we were in a place with the it was so jammed that the cell phone networks weren't working very well, so it was hard to tweet. And you know the new rules about Twitter: you have to put a picture if you want engagement. Absolutely, three hundred to four hundred percent more engagement. Absolutely. But then, and no one could tweet because they, there was no signal. But then I remembered that I had set up my four oh four oh four. What is that? The ability to tweet via text, via SMS, awesome. and I was able to tweet out and get at least the text out, which almost nobody in the room was. So I mean, in the build in that public yeah. space. So we started telling people to uh, go ahead and do that. The problem is you have to set it up in advance. Sure. You cannot do it on sure. the ground when the network is down. You have to do it from your desktop uh, yeah. on uh, uh, earlier. And, but it was it was a good reminder to me that you need to set up things in advance before you need them. It's right. just like LinkedIn. Too many people in our worlds do not use LinkedIn properly. They think of it as a career tool. I'm sorry, they think of it as a job hunting tool when it is in fact a relationship tool that you should be building out long in advance because if you start using it the day you get laid off, it's too late. My wife, her Twitter handle is Rupa Online, R O O P A Online. She does a lot of business strategy, and uh, she worked at big, big companies. So she knows when a company is having layoffs because she'll get like ten invitations from one company. But it's too late to join LinkedIn then. And what happens is you come across as desperate. You don't know the language, the etiquette, or how to use it properly. And desperation does not work on LinkedIn. And just as it doesn't work on eHarmony or Match.com or JDate or any of those services. So, so let me ask you a question. What you're you're describing a an absolutely contemporary digital view, 
and yet you're working in a very in, in an organization that by its nature its Delicious cuisine paradox looks backward <laughs> how do you bring these two together yeah. this morning as part of that tour our group met with Ken Moore Ken started 42 years ago at the Met as a night watchman today he's the head of the world's best collection of musical instruments this would be its own premier museum in the world in musical instruments if it wasn't inside the Met and this gentleman is thinking about digital from 1970 he was using digital technology to enhance his collection what's in his collection the world's oldest piano which is still in tune and he still plays on occasion wow. he also has enormous collections of Indian non-western musical instruments uh, he had the it, since I've been here Steve Martin's played Roseanne Cash has played uh, Steve Miller uh, and Steve, uh, Steve Miller from Abracadabra fame some of you might know too many people are too young to know who Steve Miller is but uh, there are all kinds of people who are in the building and come and play we have Stradivarius uh, instruments so all kinds of things here but we're talking to people at SoundCloud and Spotify how can we use contemporary technology to tell better stories of things from long ago mm -hmm. and that's what we want to work on and improve and, and, and see what we can do and that's what makes this place so alive and so exciting to be a part of and when we look at the Met, the Met at any point has a hundred job openings and what I say to people is that um, you know in our department in the art department it's very easy to hire people because they want to be here their whole lives but here in technology it's a little different people have not necessarily even spent much time in the Met how do I compete for developers with you guys how do I compete with Wall Street server farms uh, equity people who can give equity and all those startups all those things so how we do it is we tell our own story about the Met what an exciting place it is that it's a place that's looking ahead and looking back at the same time an institution that to survive has to be thinking ahead all the time but always thinking about our great scholarship our great authority but making it all accessible and if we can crack that or continue to crack that we're gonna do fine so so but still how do you bring you know most of the people who are working at the Met are not digitally focused. They're focused on the their the depth of knowledge of as academics and so forth. So how do you that's a cultural element yeah, to, I guess that's, that's, to making this digital transformation work. I would assume. You, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, it's the culture. How do you bring the culture this way forward? Well the way we do it is very carefully uh, bringing people along like somebody said to me you're never going to get a hundred curators to uh, do all these new things and I said oh my god if I had a hundred curators who want to do things I'd be drowning I can't do that all I need are people who want to do things and then others will come along I have 20 years of experience doing that in the world of Columbia you think uh, museums are slow and careful what about universities right so uh, I have experience bringing people along I used to do workshops in uh, in the early 90s mid 90s about a new form of technology that everybody needed to embrace but wasn't sure of and that technology email, email. Well, I would say why we should use email people say oh I love the facts why would you want email and what happened is that people you have to show them what makes sense and we I had that with email I had that with uh, with the web in general we had that with blogging and then social media tonight I'm doing a social media workshop for 200 people and the idea is how do we do social better how does it make sense for us and if we can bring them along in universities we can certainly bring them along here at museums these people understand technology but not necessarily what you and I are talking about think about that uh, that cup again why does it exist today because the people who made that cup use the right technology in 2000 BC or 1000 BC or 100 BC and because of that that cup exists today that beautiful iPhone that you own will die in two years so technology has been part of museums forever it's just that a different kind of technology 
we, we had a question earlier from Brian Fanzo who asked, how do you extend the in-person experience digitally? Thank you. That's a great question and something we think about all the time. What I want to do is build a virtuous circle. Have such a fantastic experience online that you want to come to the museum. And then when you're here, have such a fantastic time that you want to stay in touch. And we need to give you a bunch of tools to do that. So we want you to come here, and then you like us so much that you actually follow us on social. Huh. And then you get our app, and you look at it. And our app, which we just launched this year, is a beautiful app. There are three principles. I'm sorry. I guess this is, is it backwards on your screen? No, it looks good. Looks good. Oh, it's good. OK. I, because it's mirrored on mine, so everything looks backward. But uh, what we, we have three principles for this. It should be simple, useful, delightful. Simple, useful, delightful. That's all we wanted it to be. And we, we're not trying to do museum in your pocket. So here are the highlights, all the things you should see. We also have here today's events. Uh, and then we have this thing called staff picks, fun things that you can look at. It says 2 million objects and many opinions. Fun things like, if we come up here a little bit, you'll see all the Met stashes, all the mustache tour. So you can take that at the Met, and you can travel. And then we also have for members. Remember that every, a lot of things are free, but we want people to sign up. We have 150,000 members, uh, tens of thousands who don't even live in America who support us that way. Uh, and then over here, upcoming events. And then finally, instead of a press release section, we just have Twitter going up here. And these are all tweets that we're posting. Isn't this, uh, I think we put it, we posted a tweet about this session. Awesome. So you guys should frame that, because this is the first time that the Met has promoted a talk that is not at the Met and not connected to art. So that's on you guys wow. and just for you. So uh, I hope you'll take a picture of this and, sure. and keep that. Uh, but the principle here we took from a couple of tools that, that we love. One is the NYT Now app. It is, uh, it is so good that I, I, I deleted my, uh, and the main NYT app. It's only 30% of the New York Times but it's the right 30% of the New York Times. Uh, another app I love called Dark Sky. Uh, in a world of thousands of weather apps, this does one thing. It tells you whether it's going to rain or snow where you're standing in the next hour. And it just works, and I love it. And they've been offered, as I understand it, lots of money to sell, and they haven't done it. But not just does it work, it looks really beautiful. And those are principles we can get behind at the Met. So these are examples of ways in which we think about technology that we don't invent. We want to work with, with companies, with partners around the world. Sal Khan, we just launched 100 videos on his platform so that we can extend the reach of what we're doing. That's just an example. That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing. So we, we have three minutes left. <laughs> Tell us anything you want. <laughs> we're just, that's we're just sitting. 42 yeah, I know, we're just, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm accused of turning into professor again. You know, I don't teach every day. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we just you know, that. We don't want to ask you questions anymore. Just talk to us, no, whatever you want. It was unbelievable. <laughs> tell us whatever you okay, think. Let me, let me tell you something funny, right? So okay. this, is, this is how I make the sale to a developer who's like, why should I come work for you when I can make lots of money? And this is what I tell them, and I'm going to tell you. Sorry, how many openings do you have right now? Uh, we have, um, I'll show you one second. Sure. So, because I'm going to follow. This is our org chart right here. Wow. And okay. all the yellows are job openings. Wow. wow. Put it away. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to tweet. We're going to tweet I'm people doing it right to. Now. Uh, yeah, this is the Met has dozens of openings at any time. Uh, but we have to find the right folks who want to come and work in this place and want to be part of this team and want to do exciting things. That's how we sell it to them. But here's what I tell them that's going to shock all the parents in the audience. I gave up free, full tuition at Columbia University for my 11-year-old children if they were lucky enough and smart enough to get in and half tuition anywhere in the world to come and work at the Met. That is no better sales thing than I can tell you. But it gets worse than that, guys. So you can do the math, how much money I left on the table. Mm. Those are pre-tax dollars. Pause. Wow. Dramatic pause. Pick your jaws off the floor. Mm -hmm. Insane, right? Totally insane. And these are my kids. And I told them, I basically think maybe they don't need an education. So 
Th that's okay. Mm -hmm. What I did to them. That those are my twins there. Yeah. Uh, but remember, my kids eat if you come to the Met. But I tell people, don't just come to the Met. Go to every museum. I don't care what museum you become a member of. Become one. The MFA in Boston, the Art Institute in Chicago, SF MoMA. Please become patrons of the art. There are people who don't understand that technology is key to museums, and we need support from the people watching, the VCs and others who have influence. We need your support. Wall Street money, oil money have built all our great museums, but now it's time for the next generation to step up and support the arts, because the arts are hard to quantify compared to certain things, Absolutely. but everything's important, and we can do it all if we have partners and people like you. Very inspiring. Wow. Very inspiring. So I hope you'll come back and be our guest again another time. I hope you'll have me back. Thank you. And I uh, just want to make an offer to everybody. If, you, if you're in New York and you, you're coming to the Met, just tweet at me or email me. I'm Sri at Sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E dot net. Or I'm Sri at Met Museum. I'm the first Sri in Google. And uh, reach out to me, and I'd love to show you around and uh, get your feedback. How do I tell a million stories to a billion people? I have no clue. I need your help. What well, I can tell you. Well, the I, chief I, well, I know officer. we'll be doing. I'll yeah. be doing that. I mean, the <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. What an offer! What an offer! It's not often you can get a guided tour. Uh, of the finest museum in the world, arguably from the chief digital officer. So you are truly so, you know, to me, if you're not accessible, you're not social. And what you just offered absolutely is, is a clear indication that not only you, you, you care about and you, you are the chief listening officer with that type of offer. So thank, thank you very I just much. I haven't, I haven't been reading the tweets that have been coming, but I see 186 tweets came during your show. That means people are listening. People are interacting. I don't know what the heck they're saying. I'll go back and read. But as long as they are, I see 206 now, the numbers jump to. I love that. And there's a lot we can all do together, guys. And awesome. And, uh, awesome. And, we, and uh, Frank Scavo, who's, who's one of the top uh, technology industry analysts in the world, he comments, OK, I love museums, but Sri has convinced me to visit them more often. Wow. Well, you made my awesome. day. <laughs> awesome. So we have been talking with Sri Srinivasan, who is the chief digital officer for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And what a great <laughs> Can I show you the only museum in experience I had before I came here? I'm just going yeah. <laughs> to show you here. I don't know if you can see it very well. But this is the Museum of Dead Technology. <laughs> And here, I got some great stuff here that many of you will be familiar with. Let's see if I can show you a couple of things. Blackberry there? No one's. Tin cans oh, yes. that work. Oh. Tin cans, they still work. Look at this phone. Beautiful. Wow. Oh, yeah. uh, I have lots of Blackberries. This was my favorite camera. This was one of the Nikon Cool Pixes. Do you remember them? Uh, no, this was the one. The Cool Pix 990 traveled with me around the world. Uh -huh. and I have lots of, lots of other things in here. I have a Walkman that most mo a lot of kids have never seen them. This is called a cassette player. And <laughs> this is in here. Um, Walt Mossberg, my hero in the world of journalism, digital journalism, said this was the best smartphone in the world. Anybody remember this? Oh, the Trio? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? I have the original Palm Pilot in here. I also have X-ray vision. Do you remember this from the back of comic books? <laughs> yes. With the bald wig. And I don't need the bald wig anymore, but I still need this. Um, I've got all kinds of uh, all kinds of crazy things. Come visit. We'll show you this as well um, over here, and uh, lot lots of great things here. The Sony e-reader, which was so beautiful, but got eaten alive by other people. And then finally, just to leave you with this idea that we can never predict. We can have great ideas. It's all in the execution. What you see here is a VHS tape about the tablet newspaper. A vision for the future, and you can't see the date. It says 1994, wow. and I love that it's from Knight Ritter, and it's on a VHS ta uh, tape. And in 1994, they had predicted and made even what was going to be the iPad. Ten years plus, ten. What is it? Fifteen 13, years before uh, it was launched. Unbelievable. And they didn't do it. So life is all about execution, and we need to keep that in mind. So I'll let you guys go. 
thank you so much for including me. I had a great time. Well, thank you. And I'll tell you that uh, Brian Fonzo says that thanks to this interview, he is going to be visiting and subscribing to the Metropolitan Museum. Thank you. And My kids will you. eat now tonight. They'll get one meal because of this. <laughs> And, uh, make up and, for the tuition. The tuition. And, <laughs> and Meg Baer, who is a, uh, a a group vice president at Oracle, says that uh, Vala and I have the best job in the world. And after this conversation, I have to agree. So, Sri Srinivasan, Chief Digital Officer of the Metropolitan Museum of New York, thank you so much for joining us. And please come again. Thank you, sir. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. And we'll see you again next time. Bye bye.